Hi, um, I'm Samuel Ankar, and this is the latest installment in my lecture series on Martin Heidegger. In particular, I'm going to be continuing the theme I introduced in the last lecture of metaphysics and modernity, and how stories about metaphysics and theology are at the essence of the major stories we've been telling ourselves about modernity, and therefore what the modern world means, and therefore sort of what everything that we think of the world and ourselves means. So these are really big issues, and I hope you're starting to see that in presenting this course on Heidegger, while Heidegger is what I am organizing the material around, and I'm only introducing what I do think is important for understanding Heidegger, I hope you see that I'm also giving, in a sense, an introduction to philosophy and theology in the 20th century. And I'm also giving an introduction to basically what I would say is the archaeological level of modernity. That is to say, if you're interested in modernity, there's many layers of interest you can have, some of which are more um, shallow than others. And by shallow here, I don't mean insignificant or easy. For example, Emil Durkheim's great work in the division of labor is neither um, easy nor shallow in any pejorative sense. Rather, it's one of the greatest works, I think, in the history of sort of human thought and social theory. However, the level of analysis that Durkheim is engaged in, while very profound and fundamental, is at the level of the organization of human society. Now, if you have something to say about that and it matters, then you're a very important thinker. However, you can distinguish that level of reality from the level of, say, ultimate reality. Now, someone like Durkheim, ultimately, you could say, dealt with that in his work on religion. But my point is sociology, very relevant in this case, um, for thinking about modernity, in, in many ways, it's the sort of field that embodies modernity studies. Sociology is still not as fundamental as philosophy. And in philosophy, there's nothing more fundamental than metaphysics and theology, understood as I've introduced them as essentially angles and aspects of an entangled singular history in the West. So today, what I want to talk about is um, the beginning of Zion and Sight. So I'm going to talk a bit about the book. And I'm going to begin to set up my um, account for an audience like this of Heidegger's own sort of metaphysics and modernity story. And I'm going to show you how that story is deeply connected to the major story on offer. And I think they're both wrong. Um, however, they're all instructive. Uh, no error that is repeated and has power is purely an error. And an account which cannot explain why the error has persisted and why the error was popular should be suspicious itself. In other words, don't trust the person who simply says this is wrong if they can't explain, well, what's right about it or what's appealing about it or why would people believe this if it's wrong. And so as we'll see, I don't really think Heidegger or the other narrative that's connected to his is wrong in any simple sense. However, I think it is fundamentally misleading. And that's what we're going to get to today. Now, I want to start um, with the very beginning of metaphysics. And I'm not going to give in this lecture a kind of historical lecture on that. I'll do that later in the course. But we're now in this sort of metaphysics and modernity story section. And so I want to tell the story of metaphysics as a story, not as a sort of scholar rigorously talking about metaphysics. And metaphysics, in a very real sense, simply begins with this book. Aristotle's Metaphysics. And there is a really good historical argument that is incredibly simplifying, sort of an Occam's razor of history, which says one of the cleanest, smartest ways to get at what the history of metaphysics is, is simply the history of engagement with this book. Um, because that's where the name comes from, as uh, I've explained, and as we see, for those of you who are familiar with the Greek text, it's just listed um, as the ton metata fusica. Um, so it's this material treatment that comes after the physics. Now that's in a very important sense something we should start with, is that metaphysics, in the sense of this book by Aristotle, that defined that word, is something that is directly connected to the study of nature. And in the traditional Platonic framework, which Aristotle defined definitively for the people interested in the metaphysical tradition in this book, the metaphysics, um, in that tradition, you can't properly study what is called metaphysics unless you have a deep understanding of principles that in Aristotle's case, he's already taught in the physics 
the Nicomachean Ethics and other places in his authorship. That's why this is a story, because if you don't know that material, you can't understand the development of the tradition, and you certainly can't understand the way someone like Heidegger is so learned and yet uh, obscu obscuring of his learning in some ways, both interesting and wrong, right? So I'm not going to even pretend that we can understand that without essentially years of prior study, but I'm telling you a story in which you can think of these ideas as characters. So metaphysics is a character that is actually from the beginning directly connected with physics. Um, physics in the sense of Aristotle has to do with the study of the realm of motion and specifically the study of form or eternal st stable identities under the aspect of motion, which means basically the natural world as we see it, the world of animals and life and development and change. Um, so that's what physics is. It's the study of form under the aspect of motion, um, form that you can't understand unless you understand the motion. An example of that is an animal. If you, if you understand an animal in a way that leads you to not realize that it uh, has a respiratory system and that it has to find food and that it has to reproduce, you won't understand the animal at all because those are distinctive elements of what an animal life is. That is, the particular forms of motion animals are capable of are distinctive to what makes animals different than any other thing. So you have to understand the realm of motion before you can understand whether there is a higher realm or whether there is a realm beyond physics. And Aristotle actually gives an argument in the physics that concedes if there isn't something called first philosophy in a distinctive sense um, that would be theology, then first philosophy would just be physics. And this kind of in a complicated way is what happens in the Stoic classification of theology as physics. That's another story. So this text is the beginning of everything. And here's the beginning of this text. Um, Aristotle says famously, I'll just read it. Pantes anthropoi to aid and I oregontai fuse. Every man or each person, all people, desire by nature to know, to understand. Um, this is the beginning of metaphysics. Literally. This is the one of the senses of the RK of metaphysics. The RK having the senses that Aristotle very importantly describes in this work. So the RK of metaphysics in one sense is this book. The RK of this book in one sense is the sentence I just read. That all humans um, by nature desire to understand, which means that metaphysics is itself built on a certain physics, a certain understanding of nature, of fuses, and a certain understanding of the human. And that understanding is, is that humans are by nature, that is, it's a part of human nature to desire to know. And Aristotle sees this as a trait that's based on our animal nature and our love of vision. And he thinks we love vision the most of all our sights because it's the sight that is sort of most capable of knowing, it seems. So this is a very important just set of arguments that the foundation of metaphysics is a philosophical anthropology that's based on Aristotle's biology. So you see your image of the human cannot in any sense be separated out from something distinct from your metaphysics. Metaphysics as a tradition is based on a roughly and broadly but profoundly platonic account of what a human being is as the knowing talking animal. And it is a very profound thing to link a fundamental biological desire and appetite, right? Appetite itself which is expressed fundamentally for a biological organism like an animal, as a mammal, it's expressed in our union of our mouths with food and our union of our mouths and our other orifices with a sexual object. These are the two fundamental forms of communion. Food, you could say, and drink, and sexual union. And therefore, there is a long history of sort of metaphysical and metaphorical transference between the consumption of food and drink and the consumption uh, or union with, if you think of like George Bataille's theory of sexuality and religion, union with uh, another person. And you, we see this, of course, in the fundamental role of the Eucharist and in, uh, in Christian liturgy, which is based, of course, on the fundamental role of uh, bread and wine in Jewish liturgy. And, and this is a part of basically almost any traditional 
culture from the Western context and wine drinking context in general, but food and drink is at the essence of culture. Um, and there's four, there's no more fundamental site of religious tension than in how in which we think about our basic desires. So Aristotle takes our basic animal desires and then he says the most elevated thing that you could possibly know, the highest things in the world, that is the archai, the sources or origins or principles of the apparent world of motion, um, we actually, by our very nature, the same way we desire sex and the same way we desire food, that same intensity and passion has a distinctive human expression in the human animal. And that is this phrase, to aid and I, just to know, to understand, to penetrate into the genesis and origin of things. That's what it means to be human. So at the foundation of metaphysics, archaeologically speaking, we have this origin in this book that is called the metaphysics. We have the RK in this literal sense of the book in this sentence. And in that RK, we see we have the union of a very specific metaphysical anthropology, which all anthropologies are metaphysical because they have to do with the being or nature or mode of existence of the human. And in metaphysics at its foundation is the claim, which is argued right in the first book, that the human being is the metaphysical animal. So metaphysics in the tradition of metaphysics is human nature. Nothing more human than metaphysics. And yet at the same time, nothing more difficult. So you could say, Sam, this is interesting about Aristotle, but how is this at all related to Heidegger and modernity? Well, now we will see uh, as we begin to look at this text. And I'm just going to read the very beginning of the text from um, the introduction. So we have the introduction, um, the exposition of the question of the sense of being, which I've read before, um, and then the first chapter, Erstes Kapital, Notwendigkeit, Struktur und Vorrang der Seinsfrage, the necessity, structure, and priority of the Seinsfrage, or the question about the sense of Sein. And then, as I've mentioned, we have the first section, the necessity of uh, a repetition of the sense of being. We've seen that in German. Now, here's the beginning of the book, which I alluded to in the last lecture. Die genannte Frage ist heute in Vergessenheit gekommen, ob zwar unsere Zeit sich als Fortschritt anrechnet, die mit der Physik wieder zu bejahen. Now, I just want to focus on the first part of that sentence. He says the aforementioned question, the question, the Seinsfrage, the question about the sense of Sein, has today sunk into oblivion. Or you could say in a very just simple literal um, translation, forgetting. Forgessen is just a German word. Forget. Forgessen height, though, is, a, is nominalized. Obviously, it's a strong word. And I render it in my translation often as oblivion when I think that's the, the sense in which Heidegger really has it. Not just sort of it's sunk, because when you say sunk into forgetfulness, as if forgetfulness is a thing, what we really mean is kind of what we mean with that metaphorical use of oblivion. It's kind of, it's passed out of existence of the mind. Um, and you can think of Vergessenheit as a kind of abyss of the mind. Vergessenheit as an abyss of the mind plays a very important role in Heidegger's thought, a very kind of appealing role. People have often been attracted to it for good reason. So this claim is the essence of this book's argument in terms of its self-positioning is fundamental. The essence appears here for the first time in this first sentence. Because he says on the one hand, the, the question of the sense of Zion, the question at the heart of metaphysics, presumably, um, has sunk into oblivion, even though in our time, and again, I'm just paraphrasing here, I have a translation of this, I'm not reading it, um, even though in our time, it's reckoned as progress to once again be affirming metaphysics. That's the latter part of that sentence. Um, so this is a paradox that opens sign and sight. And this paradox is very important because it does give in a compressed way, as I mentioned, is the case with good authors. And I think Heidegger, in this sense, for all of his weaknesses of obscurity and sometimes just a, a kind of bullshit, he is, he is often capable of being very clear, and, and he sometimes does think in a really sh a good straight line. And certainly the beginning of his book has a lot going on. And so in this beginning, we see this paradoxical situation in which 
Apparently, in Heidegger's view, the world around him is again affirming metaphysics, yet um, he thinks that the actual question that is at the heart of metaphysics, or should be the Seinsfrage, the question about the Zin, the sense of Sein, he thinks this is sunk into oblivion. Now notice that what he's done there very brilliantly, and you'll see this develop in the rest of the paragraph, is he's introduced the Seinsfrage as a historical object implicitly. So Heidegger's metaphysical narrative, his theological, philosophical, religious narrative of modernity in the world has to do with the state of concealment and apparency, you could say, of the Seinsfrage, or Heidegger's apparent posing of the metaphysical question. And so therefore Heidegger weds together implicitly but inescapably in the very first sentence of this book a narrative that says that the essential thing that we should be looking at is the question about Zion and particularly at least the sense of Zion and the question of its sense and that this question is a question that Heidegger himself is not just making up okay so he's not just making it up that's he's presenting himself as posing a question which in some sense has a history so what is the history, then, we ask? What is the Geschichte, okay, of the Seinsfrage? Well, the history or the story of the Seinsfrage is apparently a story in which its current chapter, Heidegger's own moment in 1920s, is a place in which the whole question has been forgotten. Now that tells you then, based on the second half of the sentence, that whatever the metaphysique which people in Heidegger's time are bayang, are affirming, um, it cannot be, for Heidegger, identical to what he thinks is the proper attention to his subject matter, the Seinsfrage. So Heidegger, right from the beginning, is making a division between some common, at least he's projecting a common understanding of the word metaphysics, which is being affirmed in his own time, and he is distinguishing that from the Seinsfrage. So whatever you think Heidegger thinks metaphysics is, note that the very first occurrence of the word in Sein und Zeit, metaphysik, is in a critical context, the first sentence of distancing, distancing this text and its placement in the philosophical moment of its own time and in the wide span of the tradition, it's distancing itself from metaphysics while at the same time centering itself on apparently the question of metaphysics. Um, I'm not going to get into an assessment of this. I'm showing you rather, I now want to bring out, I'm showing you the implicit structure of this story. And Heidegger develops this story in not a consistent way, but in, I would say, a recurrent way. He's always returning. And the story of the kind of forgessen height designs is a very important living aspect of Heidegger's development as a philosopher and as a denker, as a thinker, as he'll later come to consider himself and his work in distinction explicitly from the tradition of metaphysique and philosophie. So Heidegger is moving towards a distinction of philosophy and metaphysics from what he does. And what I want to suggest, before, without getting into the question of the keta, or the turn, is that is happening right here very explicitly in Sein und Zeit. And however you read the late stuff, clearly it is a development of this mature early self-image, which is that metaphysics as it's being discussed is not what Heidegger is doing. Um, and it's not what he is interested in. What he's doing and what he's interested in is something that has been forgotten. Now, how long has it been forgotten? I'm not gonna fully interpret this, but I'll just give you the next part of the question, uh, the context for this claim about his narrative. Dabei ist die ungerührte Frage doch keine beliebige. Sie hat das Forschen von Plato und Aristoteles in Atem gehalten, um freilich auch von da an zu verstummen, als thematische Frage wirkliche Untersuchung. Now again, the basic sense of this, again I have a translation of these early parts of the book, but just as a paraphrase, for my purposes, all that's relevant is, he's giving you the time frame, he's talking about the research study of Plato and Aristotle um, in this sentence, um, and how it's been suspended, um, and he points in this passage, this very kind of difficult, complex passage to render, I think, as a translator, um, he points to the fact that the research, 
either, you know, of Plato and Aristotle as well as perhaps on Plato and Aristotle has silenced, it has rendered mute for Stuman a thematic question and investigation of the Zeinsfrage. So something about the very structure of philosophy, presumably going back to Plato and Aristotle, in other words, the notional founders of metaphysics, something about the very structure of philosophy has fallen and is corrupt. And now, as I end this in the last few minutes, I will want to bring out explicitly the narratological structure of Heidegger's story. Heidegger's story is a fall narrative. And fall narratives are profoundly powerful because they are at the heart of Western philosophy. I'll talk about this a bit more in my next lecture on sort of metaphysics and modernity, uh, the details. But the fall narrative has a structure, which in its simplest form is that from which you fall, the fall, and that to which you fall. That from which you fall, so if you fall, you have to have fallen from something. The fall itself as an event, an occurrence, what is it? What does it mean? And then that state that results from the fall, okay? This creates a distinctive grammar, which I discuss in all of my work, but it's a central aspect of my book and my argument about the evolution of Western philosophy and religious culture. So this structure is expressible fractally, you could say, at any level of, um, of, you could say, zoom. You could zoom into a tiny level and you'll see the same pattern of this fall narrative. You can zoom out to a bigger level from the individual to the society. You can go from society to history, from history to the cosmos, from cosmos to the nature of God itself, like in the Kabbalah. And you can always insert a fall narrative. It is the most fundamental grammatical feature of the Western tradition. I'm not saying distinctive. That's a comparative question I'm not going to address in this context. But it is a very distinctive uh, structure of almost all of Western uh, philosophy and theology. Again, particularly when you understand theology as the most religiously explicit and highest dimension of the philosophical tradition. So in Heidegger's narrative, here's the implicit structure. From at least the time of Plato and Aristotle, there was some presumed fall. And what was the fall into? Well, whatever it was into, let's say what it fell into and what its effects are, we don't know how to distinguish yet. Maybe they're the same thing, but what the fall of fell into or affected was vergessen height, with the oblivion into which the Zeinsfrage has fallen. So the Zeinsfrage has come in, you know, coming is the literal German word gekommen. It's not idiomatic, obviously, to translate it that way. So it's, you could say it's sunk, it's fallen, it's come into oblivion, into forgetfulness. Well, how long has it been in forgetfulness? Well, it looks like potentially, if you want to overread the first paragraph, and overreading, which we know is actually justified by the rest of this text in its relevant context, uh, it's been fallen since the beginning. So now notice, here's the unity. From, from what has Western history fallen? The Zeinsfrage. To what has Western philosophical history, and even all of Western culture, fallen? It has fallen into a kind of Vergessenheit des Seins. A forgetting of sein, a forgetting of reality, to be, existence, essence, a forgetting of what it means to be, a forgetting of even the question of what it means to be. Now, we now know the end point of the narrative in a basic sense. It fell from the Designsfrage into Vergessenheit, now into awakening. And who is the awakener? Who is the one who is raising the curtain on the state of concealment and oblivion and forgetfulness into which the state of the Zion's Raga has fallen? Who other than Heidegger himself with his text? So you can see why Heidegger was so charismatic. You can see in a world in which God was already dead and yet so many gods were living, why a generation of philosophically and therefore religiously minded, brilliant young intellectuals, artists, thinkers of all stripes, social theory, law, politics, theology, philosophy from Jewish, Christian, atheist, all kinds of backgrounds, why they were so struck by Heidegger's work, both as a direct teacher, and if they didn't know him, then through this book. And I think this is the beginning of the great appeal. This is the, now the RK, 
of sign and sight. I read you the arche in a literal sense of the metaphysics. And I pointed out that the metaphysics is in a deep sense the arche of the metaphysical tradition in Western culture, the one that made up this word and this idea for theology and first philosophy. And now I've begun by giving you the arche of this text. And I hope you can see that what I call an archaeological account, a logos of the arche or the archai, the principles, the causes, the genesis, the origins, and this ideal, if you're interested in my archaeological work and how it matters in scholarship, I have a big article coming out in March on science and religion and origin story. And you can see some of that in print there if you're interested. But this is an archaeological account of metaphysics and of Heidegger. And you can see that what Heidegger is doing is from the very first sentence, he is positioning himself as the reawakener of the lost question of Zion. To that question, and to a broader and different version of the story Heidegger is telling, we will come in the next lecture. Thank you so much for joining me. I ask that you like the video if you've appreciated it. Subscribe. Consider supporting me on Patreon. And if you're interested in more of my thoughts, I deal with this material in a very different and deep way for those interested as context in my History of Greek Philosophy course you can get from Learn25. So thank you very much. I look forward to joining you next time.